So as I was saying, I'm excited to welcome Ben Schneiderman back home to the HCIL, albeit virtually. Uh, today, he's going to be sharing with us some of the work that went into his latest book, Human Centered AI. And if you're not familiar with Ben, well, he is an Emeritus Distinguished University Professor in the Department of Computer Science at the University of Maryland, and he is our founding director of the HCIL, which began 39 years ago. We'll be celebrating 39 years of the HCIL this May at our annual symposium. Ben has been a giant in the field of HCI, and I think we're all very excited to hear kind of what he's been thinking about where the field is going. So to give Ben as much time to talk as possible, I'm going to pass it over to you, Ben, and uh, take it away. Well, thank you, Jessica. And thank you for taking on the running of HCIL, the ninth director. It's a great sense of satisfaction to me that this institution has gone on well beyond you know, its initial uh, launching and that so many people have taken strong efforts to it. And it's because it functions as a community like no other group I know on campus and brings people together and uh, supports them. You know, it's a wonderful feeling when there's the, the clinic paper reviews and the symposium and the practice talks that um, people actually work to help you do a better job. It's a pretty nice experience. and. Uh, if you're living in this wonderful community, you may not be aware that not all academic communities are as <clears throat> warm and supportive, but there's often a slight tinge of competitiveness. And <laughs> uh, uh, But uh, HCIL functions in good ways, and HCIL has a, a warm history. I guess it's a good place to start my slides and uh, put them up. So let's go to the slides. As I say, I'm always proud to wave the flag of the HCIL and uh, this wonderful group on campus that's helped so many students and done so many interesting things. And I don't have to tell you, this is what I usually show in my talks. And I also mentioned the book and that's been my calling card for a long time. And the fifth edition, sixth edition took five co-authors to tell the story of the remarkable impact this modest sized community has had in so many ways in mobile devices, e-commerce, web design, and uh, and and much more. Especially, I would say, um, the uh, accessibility issues, which the Trace Center continues, and in good ways, and many other projects. Anyway, um, whoops, that's the story for today. Is human-centered AI, and <clears throat> as Jessica said, it's kind. It is my current direction. And that's what sort of motivates me with great excitement to and passion uh, to tell the story here of, of what is important. And what is human-centered AI? Well, there are many definitions. I'm pleased that the term is rapidly growing in, in, in importance and has become the theme of workshops, conferences, special issues, and so on. For me, the uh, wrong screen. For me, the key issue is amplify, augment, empower, and enhance people. I think that's uh, you know been the central message of HCIL in its many years, and that remains our, uh, our, our calling card about doing things that enable people to have superpowers. So that's kind of a great aspiration, but what do we mean by that? And um, the story goes, there's three parts to this talk here. Um, there's uh, the HCAI framework, uh, which gets uh, us to talk about the fresh way of thinking. And then we'll talk about the other two parts in this talk. I'll try to be brief, about 35 minutes, and then we'll be able to have lots of discussion. So in the first edition of the book, um, in 1986, I wrote a chapter called Balancing Automation and Human Control. And I was influenced by the writings of Tom Sheridan, a uh, professor at MIT, who had written um, a, a paper and continued the idea of levels of automation from zero automation, which meant full human control, to 10, which was full machine automation and control. And that idea of a single dimension 
from human control to computer automation uh, was influential to me and to others for 40 years. Um, it, it assumed that the more machine automation you had, the less human control you had. And I accepted that idea, as did many other people. It seems to make perfectly good sense. But over the years, I became less and less comfortable with that. And I began to shift my thinking. Uh, and later edition, that chapter became ensuring human control while increasing automation. A little bit of a puzzling statement at first, even to me. And I struggled to what that meant. And eventually, it became clear to me that these were separable dimensions where they could be, that you could go from low to high level human control and low to high level automation. And that we should think of automation as enhancing human control. The thermostat is a bit of automation that lets you better control the temperature in your household. Okay, so it's your temperature control, you set it, and you're, you're getting your choice. So the way I manifest this is in two dimensional representation of that I've gotten very warm feedback about how this opens up people's thinking to new possibilities. So we think of, of high levels of computer control, which are autonomous or automatic, and uh, the pacemaker embedded in your chest, well, it would seem like that's completely automatic and it just functions on its own. The airbag deploys in 200 milliseconds completely on its own. So it's all computer automation. And indeed, for some things which are remote or isolated or for rapid performance that uh, you, know, you need to have automation. On the other hand, I became aware and others talked about human autonomy and human mastery, I think of heard, and the idea of riding your bicycle or playing the piano or being a parent. Uh, those were places where you wanted to do it you wanted your full autonomy, you wanted to make mistakes, you wanted to be creative, and it was yours, okay? So that was a very different you know, quadrant in this story. And the place we really wanna go is what I call reliable, safe, and trustworthy, uh, a magical blend of these uh, capabilities where we have high levels of computer control put in a way that's reliable, safe, and trustworthy, and gives us the control we expect. We don't want to control everything. We want to control the things that matter to us. So when we get to an elevator, we push the button, the light goes on. It shows that the elevator is arriving. It seems to respond to us. We open, the door opens, you step in, you press the sixth floor, and the doors close and the lights show one, two, three, four, five, six, and the doors open. You got what you wanted. The automation served your needs, okay? And it's reliable, safe, and trustworthy, built over 100 years with triple backups to prevent the kind of failures that early elevators had. Um, and it became reliable, safe, and trustworthy. My favorite example is the digital camera on your phone where there's a high degree of automation. There's a lot of machine learning, setting the aperture, setting the focus, reducing hand jitter, uh, changing the balance of color to make sky look like sky and grass look like grass, green, and all of those things happen through machine learning algorithms. Yet, yet, it's your picture. <laughs> you point the camera where you want to, you zoom into what you want, and you click for your decisive moment, okay? It's your picture. And then you're still in control. You can edit that picture, you can change it, you can modify lots of things on it, and importantly, you can share it easily with friends and family. So you're in control, okay, in lots of ways. Not just the very moment, but the before, during, and after is a high level of human control of the things that matter to you for your creative and social processes, okay? So the idea of design split out from one dimension to actually many dimensions. And some people have suggested two dimensions are not enough. I need three or four. Um, and yeah, I mean, one might separate this another dimension to me, would be the, um, the, the, the consequentialness of errors. So lightweight recommenders would be one level. Consequential decisions for legal, financial uh, decisions would be another. And then the highest level, life critical decisions in medicine, in transportation, military, and so on. So you, there's lots more that could be added to this. 
But I felt the need to add these borders on the right side, the level of excessive automation, which happens when you put too much control in computers. And the you know, paradigmatic example of that is the Boeing 737 MAX, which now almost three years ago resulted in two crashes because of the highly autonomous system um, that, that the pilots did not even know existed. And so it was an excessive level of automation. They could have turned it off, but they didn't even know that it was turned on. They weren't trained, they weren't aware of it. Um, and so it resulted in these two tragic deadly crashes on takeoff. So there can be excessive automation. There can also be excessive human control. And this has long been a design feature for human factors uh, designers. Uh, where you put guards or interlocks on devices to prevent people from doing things that would be harmful. For example, your self-cleaning oven, once the temperature goes about 600 Fahrenheit, you can no longer open the door, a very reasonable precaution. It's not easy to design these kind of limitations. Would you accept a car which prevented you from going above 20 miles above the speed limit? Uh, would you buy that car? Would you be concerned about it. So the, the right forms of, of human control and dealing with excessive um, you, you know, human control have become important issues. Well, let's take a look at some other examples. Um, So-called patient-controlled analgesia, PCA. Uh, these designs go back to World War II, where the morphine drip bag in the lower left quadrant had no automation and no human control. The bag just drip, drip, drip. And if it was right, it would reduce the pain and not overly dose the patient. But that was a problem. Too much morphine can be deadly. And so the automatic dispenser that measured human heart rate and breathing limited the dangers of excessive morphine. Uh, but the, the dangers of insufficient morphine were that the patient was still in pain. And so the patient guided dispenser gave the patient a control clicker that they could get more morphine if they wanted. However, it had the interlock of preventing you to get too much morphine. So you limited the number of times you could squeeze the trigger in a, in a given time period. And, and so that's a good direction. The future direction for these devices is patient guidance but clinician monitor that a hospital control center may monitor 50 or more of these devices to make sure everything's going okay everywhere and detect when devices have failed or power has gone out or the patient's suffering, um, et cetera. Uh, and also thereby collect the data to improve the algorithms that manage uh, this uh, automated process. So uh, we're learning, if we think about the design as a more nuanced process, uh, you can get this balance. One more example would be a wheelchair, the early wheelchairs, think of Franklin Roosevelt in a push chair, heavy wooden push chair, which required a caretaker to push around. Uh, but we went to robotic and sometimes automated wheelchairs that would wheel you from one place to another. And then we got the hand guided, user controlled, lightweight wheelchairs that patients could move themselves around. And that led to wheelchair races, wheelchair basketball, and, and, and many other creative outlets. So when you bring these different perspectives, you get new opportunities. And then the future direction for wheelchair chairs are motorized, joystick controlled, but possibly teleoperated and programmable where a central uh, station, a control center will monitor hundreds or thousands of wheelchairs and collect data about where the streets are, are too bumpy and have cracks in them or potholes. And so you can collect additional data to make the process safer for for all, all wheelchair, wheelchair users, avoiding dangerous intersections or, or problems on the road. So that's kind of the first notion here to open up your thinking and to realize that design is a nuanced, multi, multi-dimensional aspect which you can change, okay? So the second notion in the book here and, and the way my thinking has shifted, and those of you who know me will not be surprised at this, but the design metaphors of AI have troubled me for a long time. And I began to adopt the kind of philosophy that others guided me to. Robots are simply not people, said uh, uh, creativity researcher, Margaret Bowden, uh, that robots are simply not people. That's just you know, important to remember. 
and designing robots to be like people is probably a mistake. I've been pleased in the last few weeks to see several articles which have talked about the, the, the problem of you know, designing with intelligent agents, that that, I, that design metaphor is increasingly seen as misleading. Uh, the three, as, oh, oh, uh, Joanna Bryson says also, humans, not robots, are responsible agents. And responsibility is a key issue in determining design for me. So in my world, only humans are responsible legally and morally. Uh, and, and this is an idea that needs to be more strongly propagated because it governs design. If you're responsible, you need to have better control panels to operate the device. You need to know when it's going bad because you are responsible for what happened, okay? Second is distinctive capabilities of computers. If you, if you think about an intelligent agent, then you might forget that computers have these more sophisticated algorithms, huge databases, superhuman sensors, information abundant displays and powerful effectors. We'll take a look at some of these in a moment, but computers are different from people and they should be. Um, it's a mistake to design a computer like a person because you're you know, suboptimal when you make that design. You should be designing computers to take advantage of their special features. And then the sort of remarkable distinctive human creativity, the passion, empathy, humility, and intuition, difficult terms to define, measure, identify, but they are a significant part of what I see as people are special and we wanna support people doing what they can. So here's how this plays out um, in the shift in the design metaphors and the thinking. We go from intelligent agents, an old idea of thinking machines or cognitive actors, which again and again has proven to be misleading, maybe most dramatically recently with IBM Watson having a garage sale of its components as it, you know, as it turned out to be a bad idea. And even two years ago, IBM signaled this by removing the term cognitive computing. That was their, one of their initial sell, selling techniques, but that was gone. And by now Watson is kind of, uh, you know, there are many interesting and worthwhile technologies there. But as one of our graduates uh, from Maryland went to work, actually two of them went to work for Watson and one of them called it a fraud. Um, and and uh, Roger Shank, natural language researcher also wrote this powerful essay about why Watson was a fraud. Uh, and so that eventually led to its undermining. For me, the world of the future is AI infused super tools like the digital camera that extend your abilities, empower users, and enhance your performance. So that's one uh, dimension. Another is the idea of teammates. And, and lately also I've been encouraged that people have spoken up against the idea of teammates, although it's still a wildly popular idea. I've got a long way to go. I need your help to sort of bring that idea under somewhat better control. And my word is maybe less compelling, but telebots, the idea of steerable instruments, prosthetics, and we'll take a look at some examples in a moment. The third notion is assured autonomy where there's a great movement towards autonomous systems. Um, Johns Hopkins Institute for Assured Autonomy uh, promotes this. I tried to get them to change their name of their institute, but did not succeed yet. Uh, but I think focusing on full autonomy is, um, is problematic. And the contrast is control centers, which uh, which manage oversight uh, of, of, of complex devices. We'll take a look at examples in a moment. The last um, social robots, the anthropomorphic humanoid ones, um, have not proven to be successful. There's a long history of work in this area, but in the recent years, Jibo, Kuri, Anki, uh, Cosmo, Pepper, all have come to their end because it's not an idea that, that, that succeeds um, there are enthusiasts who love these things, but they don't succeed. What succeeds are what I'll call active appliances, consumer oriented for wide use, low cost. And we'll take a look at these in a moment. Okay, so the super tools, I already mentioned digital cameras, which give you so much control over what, the, what your image is like. Lots of automation, lots of powerful features driven by machine learning algorithms, but the things that matter to you are under your control. Similarly, a you know, digital navigation, 
here's a course from the White House to you know, the University of Maryland, and it gives you three choices. It gives you a preview. Uh, it gives you information. Machine learning algorithms calculate the, 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 the estimated time. They predict the time for each of these paths. And you can choose which route you want, the direct one, which has a lot of stoplights, or the longer one, uh, which might be more scenic and fewer stoplights, but maybe consumes more gas. So those are kind of issues to take a look at in the way you can blend together the idea of machine learning algorithms and user control. Uh, same goes for text and search auto-completion. I type U, University of Maryland, and I get some suggestions, but it's my choice as to what I do, or I just ignore it and keep typing. And that's what happens with spelling corrections as well. I can accept uh, or, or reject them. Um, a more ambitious super tool would be the Bloomberg terminal. And uh, this is a remarkable blend again of AI. Uh, Bloomberg takes in 1.6 million text articles per day uh, and natural language algorithms, thank you, Hal DeMay, um, process these and organize them in ways that are, are tailored to the needs of individual uh, traders, financial analysts, journalists, and so on. Um, they have control over how they set up the screen and the strategy is generally a tiled non-overlap display with spatial stability. So you know where to look and with a glance, you get to see the information in these information abundant displays. And this strategy is so successful that 300,000 people around the world pay more than $20,000 a year to have this on their desktop. Uh, another, to me, strong example of how you, you build AI algorithms in, but you give user interfaces that give users control. The active appliances are, are proliferating through our houses and worlds. <clears throat> Google Nest or iRobot Roomba. We bought one about a year ago and we're still using it. It has its problems, but it's still an interesting example. It's not at all like a social robot. In fact, it's not communicative very much at all. And uh, I'd like to know more about where it's going to go next and how long it's going to be in my office so I can clear out uh, at, at the right time. And every one of the devices that are common in the house are increasingly um, infused with AI technologies. Uh, so the dishwasher and the clothing washer and so on are all the way we're going. And even your programmable coffee maker. So. Uh, pacemakers have gone from being fully autonomous to being user controlled. Um, you now through Bluetooth get control on your cell phone so that you can change things in the behavior of the pacemaker. And at the same time, Medtronic manage, monitors 10,000 um, pacemakers so they can improve the algorithms for everybody or for distinctive people with different kinds of heart problems. And so here we have that good blend again of there's a certain degree of autonomy, but there's a certain degree of human control. And that nuanced blend is what I think is the, the direction of the future. Uh, another sort of common story is the Mars rovers. And some people celebrate them as autonomous because they're far away on Mars. And yes, in fact, they can, they can move around, avoiding obstacles, avoiding precipices, autonomously turn their solar panels to get the best lighting, autonomously turn their antenna so that the signal can be as strong as possible. On the other hand, there is a control center with about 80 people who, who actually operate this device on the surface of Mars and make planning of missions. Uh, they deal with repair of problems uh, and, and they take opportunities. When something special, unusual happens, they can shift the, 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 the directions and the purposes of the Mars rovers. So there again, we're looking for this nuanced blend between the automation and the human control. Um, <clears throat> another example is uh, the surgical robots, so-called. And journalists love to write headlines that say, you know, surgical robots do better than human surgeons. Uh, but as the manufacturer says, robots don't perform surgery. That's their website. 
your surgeon performs surgery with Da Vinci by using instruments that he or she guides via a console. And that's the power of this, um, this device, that it amplifies, enhances, and empowers the surgeon to make very small incisions and place powerful instruments at the right place and to operate deep inside human body uh, to be able to perform surgeon surgeries that are less invasive, uh, less problematic, more successful, and uh, better outcomes for the patients with faster recovery. So that's the kind of blend I, I want you to think about and that I'm promoting here. The control center here, a hospital control center, monitors not just what's happening in the emergency room, uh, but with many other aspects of the hospital. And so humans are working and communicating here. And these kind of control centers, whether for industrial uh, plants or uh, air traffic control, or here a counterterrorism center, information abundance uh, displays and humans working together. And you know, my favorite way of telling the story is my bumper sticker. Uh, can you see it? <laughs> humans in the group, computers in the loop. <laughs> humans in the group, computers in the loop. And I'll make a special offer for HIL. Send me your, your mailing address and I'll mail you one of these. <laughs> uh, so uh, I think it just helps to remind you that there's a different way of thinking about design that goes beyond the full automation or full human. Okay, part three is the governance structures uh, to make this happen. Um, and uh, for me, it's a multi-layered uh, process here. There are 15 recommendations that stem from the original article in the ACM transactions on in, uh, interactive and intelligent systems, but the book more than doubles, uh, maybe triples the size of that uh, argument. And the 15 recommendations are split out, you know, five about teams, five about organizations, and five about industry and government oversight or regulation. Um, I won't have time to talk about all of these, but I think you, you get the idea that there are certain things that software engineering teams do. That's the technology-based side. And for me, well, I'll move along and say something about, we'll, we'll take a look. Well, maybe I should say about the organization structures beyond the team structures, that um, the, 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 the idea of a safety culture is increasingly uh, embedded in the design of uh, advanced technologies where uh, an organization may have dozens of software engineering teams, but the management has a strong commitment to safety in its hiring training, in its, its careful review of failures and near misses, uh, and, and then industry standards that it adheres to. The certification by industry is a, another kind of more socio-technical and business-related notion. And the idea of auditing firms, um, KPMG, Deloitte, PwC, and so on, who, who audit the financial aspects of companies are now stepping forward to audit the technology and AI side of companies as well. Similarly, insurance companies are now part of the mix and could play a key role as they have in building construction in medicine and transportation. And you know, the, the companies I've talked to, the insurance companies, really don't know whether they should charge when we're doing we're talking about Tesla cars or you know, automated self-driving cars. Should they charge a higher premium for owners of Tesla autopilot or a lower premium? And the fact is they don't yet know. Mm. Tesla tells us, oh yes, our cars are safer, uh, but Tesla does not share the data that they base it on. On the other hand, the National Highway Transportation Safety Agency has launched a, an investigation uh, to study 11 known autopilot crashes of Tesla cars into police, fire, and ambulance emergency vehicles at the side of the road uh, where the Teslas plowed right into them and causing deadly outcomes in some cases and injuries in other cases. And so, you know, the need to understand what's going on and to produce the transparency and the audit trails that will allow investigators to know what went wrong 
And so when things go wrong, they only go wrong once, they get fixed. That's why civil aviation has been so successful because the flight data recorders have provided the data that um, helps accelerate the process of maturation of technologies to make them more successful. Um, government regulation is the outer layer here. And while industry has in the past, you know, painted, painted this fearful picture of automation, of, of regulation reducing innovation, it does not have to be the case. In fact, um, the experience with car fuel efficiency and car safety showed exactly the opposite. When government regulations required um, improvements to the outcomes, industry stepped forward with a you know, massive innovation to make fuel efficient and safer cars. And that's the result of government regulation. They resisted at first, but now they're great enthusiasts. I think in the field of AI, the GDPR in Europe, which, which, which assured um, explainability um, was a, a similar transformative moment. When that was launched, what is it, seven or eight years ago? Uh, it triggered a huge outpouring of tens of thousands of papers about explainability. And we'll talk about that right now. So the part I want to focus on is the reliable systems that come from software engineering strategies for teams, the audit trails and analysis tools I've been talking about. But to me, that's an important research topic. And, and yet we haven't seen much happening in the AI community. There are lots of patents about um, flight data recorders, and truck data recorders, but there's very little research. The AI research community could step forward and, and study what audit trails should be uh, added. Uh, and, and just to put emphasis to that, the National Transportation Safety Board in its investigation of the 2016 deadly crash of a Tesla on autopilot, uh, one of its 12 recommendations was to have improved audit trails so that investigators could understand what went wrong. Um, these other issues, uh, how the maze contributed to the software engineering workflows and, and the idea of documentation uh, of these through Microsoft and, and um, uh, Google and IBM have all offered uh, data sheets for data sets and many other variations, fact sheets and other forms of documentation, which I think are important steps forward. Um, attention to bias testing to improve fairness has also grown. The FACT concept, co conference is another way that uh, we've seen a grand explosion of interest triggered by this expectation of greater fairness. Uh, we'll focus here in the remaining minutes on explainable user interfaces, and that um, became such a huge topic seven or eight years ago. Uh, the majority of the work that I see is about retrospective explanations. That is, the, the AI machine makes a decision about a mortgage, a parole, uh, a hiring decision, and then the, the, the user says, huh, what happened? I don't understand why I got rejected and they are deserving of an explanation. And the most of the literature discusses whether that's a global or a local explanation, global being specific to the, to the case of the user or global, which explains how the neural net machine learning process works. Um, these seem to be, there's some hope for them. And I struggled hard to find a good example to put in the book of a retrospective explanation that was good. Uh, but uh, there are a few, but not many. Mostly uh, I find this research direction questionable in its outcome. My preference, and I became, uh, began to realize that the new goal might be to prevent the confusion and surprise that re require explanations. And so I call these prospective user interfaces. And, um, they are interactive, visual, and exploratory. And that's my, you know, one of the strong suggestions of a fresh direction that's human-centered. So let's take a look at a little toy example, a familiar one about mortgage loans. Uh, you are requesting a mortgage loan. You say you want $375,000. 
Your household monthly income is 7,000. Your liquid assets are 48,000. And now you invoke the machine learning model and you get a response with what's characterized as a pretty good retrospective explanation. We're sorry, your mortgage loan was not approved. You might be approved if you reduce the mortgage amount requested, increase your household monthly income, or increase your liquid assets. And so those are kind of reasonable, actionable notions here, but you don't really know how much you need to reduce your mortgage amount. Maybe you just drop it 5,000 and you'll be okay, or maybe it's 50,000. Uh, you don't know how much you have to increase your monthly income. That may be tough for you. Uh, you could increase your liquid assets by borrowing money from family, uh, but you don't know how much you need. So the alternative, again, this is a toy example, a very modest one. Real situations are much more complicated, but you know the visual, interactive, exploratory notion would be represented by this diagram where the mortgage amount requested is here. You can move the slider to the left or right. If you move it left to reduce the mortgage amount, you get more blue, so your score goes up. <clears throat> if you increase your household monthly income by moving this to the right, you get more blue. And if you can increase your liquid assets, you get more blue, getting closer and closer to the score you need. Uh, this strategy allows you to explore alternatives and see the sensitivity analysis. Which of these three variables has the greatest influence? Where should I put my effort? So this prospective user interface returns control to the human. And I might say this is modeled on the, the, the experience from 30 years ago of knowledge-based expert systems, which didn't quite work out but the rule-based systems that followed that went step-by-step -step in a prospective way were more successful. Um, and similarly, the attempts of retrospective explanations for uh, human help, online help for, for user interfaces, uh, gave way to better design of prospective interfaces, such as Amazon's checkout process, which has a, at the top a little stripe or a little bar that shows you the stages and the and it, you can go forward or backward in that process, you're more in control. And at each stage, the number of decisions is small. You can understand them or get explanations of the terminology uh, or, you know, or, or, or the things you need to change to enable this transaction to complete. And so the, the, the decomposition into a step-by-step -step process is, seems like the virtuous way forward. Um, this idea is spreading, and this charming one, I found a group of, of British librarians who set up a website with slider control for choosing novels, and you choose four uh, sliders, and so here you can uh, choose the slider for funny to serious, beautiful to disgusting, no sexual content to explicit sexual content, optimistic to bleak, and as you move the sliders, the covers change within a few hundred milliseconds. So you know why you're getting one of these recommended, recommended covers because you chose these things. Other services like newspapers have smaller sl collections of sliders like politics, sports, and entertainment. If you move politics to the far right, you get more politics. If you move sports to the far right, you get more sports events recommended and sports articles recommended. And this idea is you know, propagated through a lot of other applications. So that's the, that's the story here. Um, there's uh, uh, three components to my talk and to the book design, the HCII framework with a set of guidelines about how to design and how to make a nuanced design, not an all or none human control or machine control, but a, a healthy mixture of both. That's what we want. And then the shift in design metaphors uh, from the older ones to newer ones that, that suggests strategies to improve human control. And the third is this governance structures with a set of 15 recommendations about what, what could and should be done. So that's the story, here's the book. Um, and uh, I was pleased, this book is just out in the last few weeks. So I got, my first review was a British science writer named Brian Clegg who said it's one of the most important AI books in the last few years. That was a good start. And then the more widely read Forbes magazine had a, 
had a great, you know, lengthy review, excellent introduction, valuable to management who need to both understand how to better direct AI development and to require appropriate AI to solve market and social challenges. And based on that, the, the book, you know, jumped up to number six in Amazon's list of top AI books and number eight in top HCI books. So that was, that made me happy for a few days. Of course, it's, it's fallen back a bit, uh, but that's the way things go. And I'm waiting to see what the next review, I've had some smaller reviews that were supportive. I'm still waiting for the, for the attack review from somebody. I imagine it'll come somewhere, but uh, others have called the book controversial, uh, which is a fair description. Uh, Virginia Dignam said, a tour de force into the increasingly important topic of human-centered AI, a must read. I might comment that Virginia has been a wonderful writer and organizer on this. She'll be running a dog stool workshop in uh, uh, this summer in person um, uh, on the topic of human-centered AI. The, the great satisfaction of the sprouting of the different groups on human-centered AI. I might, I might note also the cover here. I worked very hard on, on getting the design for a cover that avoided the old cliches of robot hands shaking human hands or, uh, and showed here. What I wanted to show was people working together or individually uh, supported by technology. That's, that's the message of this book and that there are ways to do it. And so uh, I, I try to get that message across here. Uh, the book's got a, you know, a sort of framing structure that starts with the high level notions of human values are what we're after when we design technology, supporting human rights, increasing social justice and, and, and advocating for human dignity. Uh, I think, I also invoke the UN Sustainable Development Goals and the 17 goals are a worthy uh, strategy to, you know, to support for any technology advance, but maybe especially. I'm pretty pleased to report Frank Bentley, uh, recently retired from IBM. He worked with us at HCIL years ago, um, but he's done good work, but he's now started a movement within AAAI, the Association for the Advancement of, a of AI um, to uh, focus on AI and climate change. And so I, I think people are coming to understand that the technology we develop um, can be put to work uh, to deal with the contemporary social issues. Certainly the questions of misinformation, political manipulation, online oppression, et cetera, are also ways in which our technologies are, uh, are, are, are put to work in bad ways. And it's part of our responsibility as designers of user interfaces to think about how to have, how make that happen. And not just user interfaces, but user experiences and community experiences as well. Um, I go on to build on a, a set of individual goals of, of enhancing human self-efficacy, supporting creativity, clarifying responsibility and increasing the potential for social connections. Uh, then we drill down to the more technical design aspirations of reliable, safe, and trustworthy. And you've seen my diagram with teams, organizations, industry, and government. So all of this breaks out into the three components of this talk and the book, the HCAI framework, the design metaphors, and governance structure. And I just have to say, you know, there's, the, the book is permeated or embedded maybe is a better word, in thinking constantly about the diverse stakeholders in any AI system. Uh, the researchers are the ones who maybe get the biggest voice, but they're, uh, they're outnumbered by the developers. And this book was written for developers as well as researchers, uh, but business leaders as well. That's why I like the Forbes magazine um, review, which, which said this was a book for managers. I wanted to reach those people as well, and policymakers and government, and then the vast number of users that are out there. So those are some of the 25 stakeholders I identify in the book uh, that we have to be aware of at every stage of design. It's also important to remember uh, the threats that are present in building any system, particularly these AI systems, the malicious actors who might put the AI systems to work for uh, cyber crime and for various forms of attack. Uh, 
and uh, and misinformation, et cetera, political manipulation of elections. The bias that incurs, that, that is endangered when we give machines too much control over decision-making. Um, yes, it's possible that well-designed machines would limit bias that is inherent in human processes. And we have to work, it's our responsibility to, to keep that in mind and do the best we can to reduce the bias by giving people tools to understand the bias and allow those kind of investigative journalists or regulatory bodies or oversight groups of all kinds to understand how the systems that they're dealing with could be biased. And the last is the flawed software. Uh, again and again, we have to have a certain sense of humility when we build these uh, tools because we don't always get it right. They don't always do what we expect them to do. And so it's important to be aware of that. And so that's the story here. If you wanna keep, um, keep in touch, uh, I run this Google group, which just this week crossed 2000 members, uh, 2000 email addresses. You can join in by signing up at groups.google.com um, and human-center-ai. Um, I put out a weekly note on Wednesday afternoons, evenings, and then I, I publish responses. Only I can post, but people send me lots of notes and they wind up in the following week's uh, discussion group. So people seem to really like that. I've had very warm responses. You can join in the fun too. And Twitter account is, is Human Centered AI. We now have a Wikipedia page on Human Centered AI. Please visit to give us some numbers there or edit it to extend what it does. And we have a website um, that covers, that has longer lists of, there are now about 20 research labs around the world at academic centers, maybe more by now, that have something like human-centered AI or ethical AI or responsible AI in their names. And so there's lots of groups, there's lots of workshops, conferences, and other activities going on there. And, it's a great satisfaction to see that that's happening. And my closing slide is just to remind you the future is human-centered if we make it so. There's a lot of work to be done, but I'm here for the duration and I hope you'll join and contribute to these efforts. Thank you. I'm ready for questions and discussion.